permission and I'll be alive. So Hannah, thank you so much for joining me today for the series of interviews uh, with UK based entrepreneurs. I'm so excited to talk with you. I uh, checked uh, your LinkedIn website, all your social media. So <laughs> I'm a bit of a creep, let's say. <laughs> uh, so I'm really, really excited. And uh, my first question uh, straight, um, in the beginning, uh, you've been traveling quite a lot, and uh, yes. you sit uh, just next to the uh, world map. So, uh, where, where was the most um, exciting place you've ever been? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I would, oh, I would probably say the most exciting place I've been is India. So uh, dis despite appearances, my dad is actually from Calcutta. He moved over to the UK when he was six years old. No one ever believes me because I'm white with a British accent, but that is true. Um, and uh, as a child, we had no connection really to our Indian heritage. And la back in 2019 was actually the first time I visited India. Uh, and I went to Calcutta and I saw where my dad grew up. And then I headed up to Darjeeling, uh, where my great grandfather went to school. Um, and that to me was just mind blowing, really. It's such a country that's completely different culturally uh, to the UK. Um, obviously, there's a lot of colonial history there, which we don't learn about in UK school. So to learn about all the awful, terrible things the British people did in India was uh, quite overwhelming. Um, so I would say India has been my most interesting place to visit and definitely the place where I'm desperate to, to go back to again as soon as possible. You mentioned it's very diff uh, different culturally. Um, did you feel yourself uh, as part of that culture or for you it was like alien uh, place? Oh, complete, Anna, completely alien, completely <laughs> alien. And I actually went over there um, and I think this is a, a white privilege um, issue. So I went over and thinking, oh, everyone's going to love me because my dad was born here and I'm going to tell everyone my dad was born in India and they'll think I'm great. Um, and actually, um, everyone I met in India, I have to say, was incredibly respectful, incredibly kind, incredibly helpful. Uh, we never had any issues in the country. You know, if we ever needed help, people went out of their way to help us, actually, when we were in India. Um, but I actually um, personally quite struggled with the fact that I came from a white background in India mm -hmm. and um, because I, I had only just really taught myself properly about colonial history as an adult, as I said, because we don't learn it in school. So mm -hmm. that to me was a difficult thing to wrestle with, but it wasn't something that was, um, you know, presented to me in an almost attack format. If anything, everyone was super excited to learn my dad was from India. No one ever believed me. Um, but yeah, I, I found it just, it, it's, it's just mad to be in a country when, um, when there's so much history there that connects it to your own country. Um, and, but yet it's, it's a completely different, you know, a completely different beast, I guess, a completely different thing. I think uh, what is the most, um, I, I, I mean, I don't know, but um, my question is, do you, do you feel it's very educational in terms of when you travel and you see all these different stories, all these different countries um, with like histories, uh, which sometimes we do not learn at school because our government probably uh, tried to teach us something, what we need to, to know as, I don't know, as uh, citizens of uh, our countries. Um, how do you feel like, is it like eyes opening experience for you? Is it like give you a different perspective on the world politics, on the what's happening um, generally with societies? What kind of, I don't know, uh, why like immigrants feel certain way towards like white people and stuff? Yeah. Well, we've got really deep, haven't we, in the first five minutes of this? <laughs> Is it? <laughs> I love it. I love it. So uh, when I went to India, it was part of a bigger trip that I did. I actually travelled overland from the UK to Bhutan and India was one of one of the last stops. Um, 
and originally we had planned me and my partner had planned to stay in India for a lot longer than we did but um circumstances changed anyway and we came back to the UK um and it was very early on in this trip um which I knew already right I'm 30 I'm 36 now at the time I was 34 I already knew not everything you learn at school is the truth you learn <laughs> especially when it comes to when it comes to history right because that is based on uh, opinions and points of view a lot of the time. So even by the time I got to Germany, you know, one of the first stops on the trip, we were in Hamburg, I went on a walking tour, I found out that nearly half of Hamburg had been razzed during World War II, you know, loads of historic buildings had been lost. And yes, I knew there had been bombing in Germany during World War II, but the impression I had been given as a child was the UK had it worst you know we had the worst bombing we had the worst experience no one had it worse than us and to suddenly have someone say well that's not true you you didn't get taught the truth and I was just on a free walking tour it almost blew my mind to the point I was like if something that huge has been a complete lie what else has been and then it continued during the trip especially through Eastern Europe learning more about communism. Um, one of our Airbnb hosts had grown up when uh, his country was communist. He'd grown up learning Russia at school. And I was thinking, what? I thought that was just like in the history books, like, you know, for like great grandparents and grandparents, but it was a very close history for a lot of people. So travel for me, I like to, um, I guess, acknowledge my ignorance and try and learn as much about a country and its history because ultimately travel does teach you that everybody's the same ultimately we all want a better life for us and our family we all want to be happy we all want to do work that makes us feel purposeful um, and that doesn't change wherever you go that doesn't change it doesn't change in the UK it doesn't change in Russia it doesn't change in Bhutan everyone's got the same kind of aims and goals about having a happy and fulfilling life but we're all coming at it from very different backgrounds and very different paths which means the way in which we see that working is different and I find that the most exciting fascinating thing about travel because on one hand you're learning about all these experiences that are making people's viewpoints different to yours but then on the other hand you're realizing we're all exactly the same and we all want exactly the same thing so it's this kind of paradox when you travel because you have one hand thinking, wow, God, people have had completely different upbringings and childhoods and life experiences to me. And then on the other hand, you're thinking, but we all kind of end up <laughs> wanting the same thing. So yeah, that, I mean, that's one of my big joys about traveling and that's why I love to do it so much. It's, it's wonderful. I think uh, what you've done, it's, um, it, it's good could be great to um, to teach it at school uh, how, how to do it uh, because I think it takes a lot of courage to just start this big travel um, to give like just to it's just like we're two of you right so just you and your partner so it's, it's like very big thing to do uh, and uh, I wish I, I, I was taught how to do it when I was at school but no <laughs> sadly <laughs> uh, I think we need more education in this area uh, so you've been traveling you mentioned uh, so you came back two years ago yes Mm -hmm. and uh, your company is a year and three months so you you came back you had this uh, kind of shift in um, probably mind a bit and you decided to start your company yes exactly so I actually came back and at the time I've always been self-employed I've always worked for myself so that's not been anything that's changed um, but previously my my main career has been in the events industry and creative industry um, a few years prior to me traveling, I'd started a art business with a friend. Uh, we had a small shop in the UK. Um, and then when I returned back to the UK, we decided that that business just wasn't either what either of us wanted to be doing for the rest of our lives, really. So we closed that business down and I was thinking, well, I don't really want to keep working in events anymore what can I do that's going to be something that I'm really passionate about? So 
you may have seen, and I'm sure we'll get onto this, you know, later in the questions, it, the original concept for Better Not Stop was a very travel focused based business solving oh. the problem for um, entrepreneurs and, and burnout. Um, and it's now evolved, you know, a year and a half in to, to a much different business. Um, part of that is due to COVID. Part of that is um, due to it just feeling a bit better in the, the way the business runs at the moment for me. Um, but yeah, I just think I wanted to do something that was a bit bigger than what I was doing before, which was working on individual projects for other people, you know, do something for three months, then get onto a new project and do that for three months. I think I just wanted to start a business that felt um, like it was bigger than me and that it was going to be kind of this continuous, larger thing that would <laughs> carry on, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Everyone wants to make impact and change our society and world to the better. So um, I, I totally get you. Um, so what you, what problem do you solve for other companies, for other people with your company better not stop? Okay, so it's, it's we're twofold uh, at the moment. So we almost have a um, B2C stream, I guess, and then a B2B stream. So mm -hmm. as a, a website and as a business, our aim is to become almost like a media platform where individuals, so consumers can go to, to discover um, not only how they can live a more sustainable and ethical life, uh, not in just how they live day to day, but how they shop and how they travel. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also working with businesses to look at how them they as businesses can be more sustainable, more ethical and almost be a business for good. Um, part of that is through certifications. Part of that is looking at bigger picture things like the sustainable development goals and how businesses can use them to grow their business. Um, but I think from my point of view, I like the one on one, like speaking directly to people about mm -hmm. what I'm doing um, and not just businesses, because I've always kind of done that in my work anyway. Um, but then I knew that working directly with businesses would be a way where I can make a lot larger impact than than just working one on one uh, and talking one on one with people. So that's kind of the two sides of the business. Totally. Um, I, I think I see kind of commercial part of your business and uh, not commercial part of your business. So when it comes to B2C, it's uh, obviously not commercial part of your business, right? And uh, B2B is kind of how you can make some money to uh, support your non-commercial part of the business and uh, basically implement these big changes into bigger picture into other companies. Am I correct? Yeah, I would say you're correct. I mean, there's things like I'm currently writing a book about my trip, for example, the UK to Bhutan one. I don't really think I'm going to be able to sell that into businesses. That's definitely going to be, you know, definitely, something that yeah. something that individuals are going to be interested in buying. Um, but I see it from um, two points of view. I think we have a responsibility as individuals to try and make better choices in our life that's better for us and other people and for the planet. But I think it's made difficult for us often because the products that we buy or the, you know, or the energy that we consume um, is not sustainable and not ethical and it's not convenient or affordable for us to have these other choices. So it's almost like I want the people to feel that they have almost not just responsibility, but the ability, they have the ability to make changes in their lives that will make a difference um, and then also to businesses to say you know look all these people do want an easier you know a better way for the planet and it's almost as a way for me to show businesses you know I've got you know this you know thousands of people visiting my website interested in these topics and if you can solve that problem these are the people that are going to want to to, to find out about it um, and I think as business owners we are we should be responsible for how the world's going to be mm -hmm. in a hundred years time. And we should be thinking like that really. Mm -hmm. um, but it is made difficult for consumers to be environmentally friendly a lot of the time. So you need to kind of put pressure on both sides because if businesses see that all the customers 
want a more environmentally friendly way, that's a good market for them to be in. Because if they're telling their customers they're doing that, they're going to buy from you and they're not going to buy from your competitor. So it's, it's good for everybody, you know? Yeah, totally. Um, I always think, uh, always been thinking that uh, as an entrepreneur and uh, as a part of this big family, uh, I am responsible for the future of our society. I know it's a bit bold, but it's how I feel that uh, big businesses were basically draw the future for all our generation. So it depends on what. Amazon, uh, Facebook, and other big companies going to do depends what services I will able to uh, get in my future. And as my part for my own business, I'm trying to do as much as I can to kind of ensure that I'm making better future for, for myself, for my kids, for future generation. So I totally understand what you're saying. And I feel myself responsible for the future <laughs> of our society. I mean, obviously, uh, we are not yet Amazon, but still we have impact, we have employees. So all this is kind of going somewhere. And uh, because we are like marketing company, uh, we advertise quite a lot of uh, for our clients. So we choose with which company to promote and uh, with, with which company we want to work and with, with uh, which company we do not want, want to work. So um, it's, it's really, uh, how to say, when you know the power of social media, <laughs> you don't want to use this power for, for like supporting uh, not that sustainable uh, companies, not that... Uh, um, social responsible companies um, I, I totally get you uh, when you're choosing so basically your clients usually in b2b uh, sector is the company which wants uh, to make bad choices yeah so uh, i think for for me it's not every company is interested in being sustainable and ethical i mean yes. prime example <laughs> yet Prime example, you've talked about Amazon, for example. Now, Amazon don't pay their taxes. If you do any sort of internet research about Amazon, they will do anything they can to avoid paying taxes in the country that they're selling. Most UK customers, actually, if you look at something you've bought from Amazon on your bank account, it will say like Amazon NL, which means that that's actually gone through a, a different Amazon subsidiary in the Netherlands, which means they don't have to pay tax in the UK. And they do that for nearly 75% of their purchases in the UK. So every time you buy something from them, even though it's super convenient and super easy. So I get I, like this again, this is saying, you know, you can't blame people for using Amazon when it's the easiest, most affordable for, thing for them to use. Like I, I do understand that. Um, but that company's not paying their taxes. And now that will have a knock on effect for you as a customer, because if that company is not paying their taxes, that money is not going to our government, which means our government doesn't have as much money to spend on the things that we use as a society, like the NHS or, you know, our universal health care or um, improving the wages of teachers, things like that. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that it's your responsibility you know, as a customer, not to use Amazon. But what I'm saying is there's there's a place there where we have to say, hang on a minute, can I try and buy this from somewhere else? And it, will it be just as easy for me? And how can I kind of make the UK government start making them pay taxes? Because that's not fair either. It's the responsibility of Amazon to be paying their taxes and be more ethical. And it's the responsibility of the government to put legislation in, in place there. But often we can be made to feel guilty as customers to, to not buy from somewhere because we're like, oh, that's not the best place to buy. But if it's the easiest place to buy, that's usually where we're going to buy from because that's just the... the it's the it's how it works, yeah. Um, yeah. I, like, about eight months ago, I realized, I, I always was thinking about plastic problem and how, how it's uh, terrible for environment. And about eight months ago, I decided to go plastic uh, free <laughs> and uh, plastic free and uh, hopefully zero free. And it's terribly inconvenient. 
So yes, you're if, right. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to try uh, live plastic free, uh, you need to put like enormous effort to do so. Uh, first of all, it's more like okay, it's kind of questionable if it's more expensive or not, but it's definitely not inconvenient. So, for example, I, I live in Glasgow. There are few plastic free shops where you can buy um, um, groceries without uh, using plastic. But we're like very far away from the city center where I live. So for me to go there, I need to whether do it on my day off or to do it like during the lunch. So don't have a lunch because when when I finish work half six, we're already closed. So <laughs> uh, it's it's very complicated. I can't just you know pop pop by during my uh, walk and get it. No, I need to kind of plan it and do it and, and you make a vet yeah Co colleagues carry on yeah so what i realized it's it's very difficult to to convince people to go plastic free even if they have the most like uh, they have the best intention but it's so inconvenient that it will be very difficult to do so what i realized we need to kind of change uh, businesses to like push uh, grocery stores such as Sainsbury's, Tesco, all of us uh, to kind of have more plastic free products to provide these options. So it's not, as you mentioned before, it's not about uh, only my responsibility as a customer or consumer to buy plastic free products. It's also responsibility of businesses to provide these plastic free products for me for me to be it convenient and not too expensive to buy so it's kind of very complicated issue which you're trying to solve <laughs> yeah and better not stop yeah and it's actually the plastic free thing for me is um something that i really get annoyed about right because plastic free is something that wherever you read it it's the customers the customer needs to go plastic free it's like you should go plastic free you should go plastic free like mm -hmm. god do you not love the planet god do you hate turtles well so, you know you should stop going plastic free and i mean you're talking as, uh, to somebody who pretty much is plastic free you know i buy a lot of my groceries from the zero waste store um we re i mean i don't eat meat for example so that's a you know if you go down the supermarket aisles where the chilled meat items are they're all in plastic so if you eat meat that's you know there's no meat wrapped in cardboard you have to buy the plastic meat even if you were prepared to pay three times as much for cardboard covered meat you're not going to find it so good luck you know <laughs> so plastic free is interesting because it's one of those issues which is almost skewed in society that it's our responsibility as the customer to be plastic free. No, it is not. I don't, I don't think. I think it should be the responsibility of the businesses selling as the items and of the government. The minute the government put the plastic bag ban in, people stopped using plastic bags. You know, 95% of plastic bag uses, usage went down simply for charging people five pence. If you make it inconvenient for consumers to use plastic, then they won't use it. No one goes to the shops and thinks, oh, I'm, get, I'm going to get 10 plastic bags now and I'm just going to pay the 50p. No, we've got our tote bags now. Everyone's used to it or we'll carry all our shopping to the car. You know, by businesses and governments make it inconvenient for us to do unenvironmentally friendly things just as a society we won't do it and plastic free is something that it's almost like we're being made to take responsibility for and there are ways in which we can try and do that but like you said it's difficult if you don't live near a plastic free shop it's difficult if you have children that only like things that come in plastic and they're picky eaters then you're gonna buy it if you've got you know if you're on a budget you're not going to buy the pasta in cardboard that's one pound more you're going to buy the pasta in plastic because it's cheaper and more convenient for you but if there was no plastic to choose from then you wouldn't choose it um but it makes it difficult for businesses too because plastic is something that is a lot cheaper for them to use as a product 
and it's also more convenient for them to use as a product. Um, so it almost is, it's, it's actually a much more complicated issue than just you and I deciding to go, try and go zero waste and plastic free because yes, you're right, it can be difficult, it can be expensive um, and you need to be organized at the moment. You know, I need to be organized about how I do my shopping because I know I get these items from the health food shop and I get these items from the supermarket and I get these items from the greengrocers. You know, I've got no kids and I work for myself. So I've got time to fit those sorts of uh, trips into my day. Not everybody does. So okay. yeah, you're, you're, I totally agree with what you're saying. It's, 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 it's a frustrating issue that we need, we as customers need more support from the government and businesses for that to be easy for us. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Hannah, just give me a second. Um, I will stop recording on pause.